welcome to the latest podcast in the series Danube Dialogues. Uh, my name is John O'Sullivan. I'm the uh, president of the Danube Institute in Budapest. Um, today I have with me my colleague, uh, uh, Mark Higgy. He's a senior fellow here, but before that, he was an Australian ambassador to NATO, uh, to the EU, and to Hungary. Uh, our guest today is David Satter, a distinguished foreign correspondent um, who has covered uh, the Soviet Union, uh, post uh, uh, totalitarian Russia, uh, the uh, communist world in general, uh, analyzing and reporting on events in those worlds. Over a long period of time, he worked in Moscow for the Financial Times, uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, and other newspapers and magazines, including my own National Review, uh, where we met, I think, David. Now, uh, you were often in trouble with the Moscow authorities dealing with the foreign media. In fact, I believe you were also the first uh, journalist to be expelled, first Western journalist to be expelled uh, from the new um, uh, post-1991 Russia. Um, so I want to really ask you first, just to tell us a little bit about yourself, because you, uh, you went to Oxford University, you're American, you went to Oxford University, you graduated, um, and then what? How does a young man starting out on life become a Kremlinologist? Over to you. Well, I had studied the Russian language, and as a graduate student at Oxford, I wrote a thesis on the political philosophy of Hannah Arendt. And uh, my first inclination was to study uh, Nazism, actually. The, uh, but I didn't speak German, so I would have had to learn German. And uh, at the same time, Nazism was a historical subject, whereas the Soviet Union still existed. It was having a huge influence on the world. And it was close by because relatively close by, by American standards, because you could get out, get on a train in, uh, in London and uh, Liverpool Street Station, and you could, and that train with a little break to take a, a ferry could t take you all the way to Moscow. And I began traveling there, improving my Russian and uh, hoping that I would at some point become a Moscow correspondent went back to Chicago, which is where I'm from, worked for four years on the police beat. And uh, when I returned to, to, to Oxford to defend my thesis on Hannah Arendt, I was introduced to J.D.F. Jones, who was the foreign editor of the Financial Times and was building one of the really excellent uh, foreign staffs uh, uh, of that period. And he, he offered me a job and he said that, uh, he asked me if I, if I spoke any foreign language. And I slightly exaggerating said, uh, I speak Russian. And he said, fine, we'll send you to Moscow. And that was, uh, that was the, and of course, once I got to Moscow, I made it my business to fully master the language, which I did actually in a relatively brief period of time was there for six years. And uh, it was a great experience because this was the Soviet Union at the height of its world power. And uh, at that time, the Soviet Union had influence in every country of the world. And it was a formidable global challenge uh, for the United States and for the West. And I, I, I lived there. What I wanted to ask you first, really, was exactly that, about the Soviet Union internally first. I mean, for example, um, what was the, the grip that the Communist Party and the Soviet ideology had on the society? At that point, surely, it was still a functioning communist state in a way that later on it ceased to be. What was that like, living there? Well, it was like living in a giant theatre of the absurd. Uh, in which an entire population was organized to, to act out a false version of reality. And uh, that false version of reality was so pervasive that people who grew up in it didn't realize its artificiality. But I, as a, as, as, as a foreign visitor, 
uh, was perfectly aware of it. Um, you had newspapers that uh, didn't contain any truthful information. Uh, you had a parliament uh, which always voted yes. You had trade unions which always supported management. And the entire population was organized in collectives, supposedly run by the Communist Party, in which uh, the line of the party was repeated mechanically, uh, word for word, uh, by, by millions of people. Uh, watching it was, was, was surrealistic. And the fact is that the, the, the country and the society function that way. So there was a lesson here, which is that human beings are infinitely malleable, and you can organize them to do almost anything. It was not the, or, the, or, the, the world as described by Orwell in 1984, but it was very close, minus a little bit of the terror, because by the time Brezhnev became the Soviet leader, terror was no longer necessary. People were already regimented. Uh, and uh, mass conformity is, is, is all that's necessary. The momentum of herd thinking uh, was more than sufficient to keep the society organized and running along fictitious lines uh, and in keeping with a, with a mendacious ideology. And I saw that. I, lived, I, was, I was part of it. Now, you wrote a book, um, The Age of Illusion. It became a documentary. The documentary won the, best, the prize for best documentary at the Amsterdam uh, Festival. And it described the later stages of the Soviet Union and um, the way it degenerated, and degenerated extremely rapidly. So I wonder if you could just tell us why it was, you think, that this extraordinary theater of the absurd eventually went along very, very different lines to those that its directors and playwrights had planned for it. Oh, just, just, a, just a note, the, the, the title of the book is Age of Delirium, uh, Decline and Fall of the Soviet Union. But the, um, it, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union was inevitable in 1980, during the Olympic Games, I was traveling around with the correspondent of the Daily Telegraph, uh, and he, he remembers this incident very well. And I told him this country won't survive, won't survive 10 years. Well, I was off by one year. Because an artificial world, you cannot forever resist the force of reality. It can keep it out for a time, but sooner or later, uh, a leak a leak appears in the dike and, uh, and it's Im immensely threatening because only constant effort can keep out uh, you know, real facts, real information, genuine human reactions. What happened uh, in the Soviet Union was that Gorbachev uh, engineered a massive leak in the dike. And uh, he, he did the one thing that no Soviet leader could afford to do. He tolerated free information. For the first time, people began to be able to read the truth in a system that had been based entirely on lies. And that opened up a contradiction in the system, which was unresolvable between the fictitious reality, which kept the Communist Party in power, and the the empirical reality of the outside world, which was capable of giving people the basis for individual self-expression and autonomy. Uh, that conflict could only be resolved in one of two ways, either through mass repression, which, for, which would have doomed Gorbachev as a reformer, or with the destruction of the system. And as we know, the result was the destruction of the system. The Soviet system was extremely stable as long as it was unchanged. But with the moment it began to try to reform itself, it's the, the, the hidden fault lines in the society were revealed and they became 
uh, they, they became fatal for the system. And what part, if any, did outsiders play in this collapse? Obviously, uh, Reagan, Thatcher, um, Helmut Kohl, um, the Pope, um, the peoples of the uh, of Eastern and Central Europe and figures like um, uh, Lech Wałęsa played a part in this. Um, but how important a part did they play? Was, was this an assisted suicide um, of the Soviet Union or was it um, some other form of death? Well, I think they played a very important part. Uh, they were an Im uh, they were uh, Reagan in particular, Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, they, they, they were uh, the decision to begin the Star Wars uh, research and, and to develop uh, uh, a, a new generation of high-tech weapons, uh, which the Soviet Union was not in a position to match. All of that, the, the, the readiness to speak openly about the Soviet ideology, to challenge uh, Russia's imperial activities, its aid for so-called wars of national liberation all over the world. All of that was important because what it did was it changed the internal calculus in the Soviet Union. Uh, the internal debate uh, was always a question of uh, the conflict between the need to reform on the one hand and the fear of reform on the other. And uh, what, what Reagan, Thatcher, and the, and the revolt in Eastern Europe, and, and in general resistance to communism did, was it changed the calculus. Suddenly it became clear that refusing to reform uh, was basically accepting short-term and long-term stagnation. Of course, changing the system represented a big risk, but uh, as the situation around them changed, the Communist Party leaders made a fatal decision for them, which was to accept that risk. And, and Reagan in particular played an important part in pushing them in that direction. There was the, the there was one just one thing to to point out. There was one very pivotal historical event which which people oftentimes don't don't uh, uh, refer to, which was the destruction of the Syrian air force over the uh, in Syria in nineteen uh, nineteen eighty one or eighty two. The the Israelis using new uh, computer technology uh, were able to destroy 81 uh, Syrian planes without losing a single aircraft. Uh, this stunned the Soviet leadership. Uh, they blamed it on the in incompetence of the Syrian pilots, but the, the, those were the best Syrian pilots. In fact, they understood perfectly well that the West was embarking on an, a new round of technological innovation that for, for, for which they did not have the means to compete. Well, I'd like uh, to come back to the question of the, the, the transformation of social and economic of um, the Soviet Union into democratic Russia and then into post-democratic Russia later. But for the moment, let me ask Mark to pick up some questioning uh, pick your, uh, your brain on what is actually happening now in, the, in Russia with the spread of riots across the country. Mark. No, thank, thank you, John. Yes, uh, David, you won't be uh, surprised uh, at us asking you uh, for your take on the, uh, the pro Navalny uh, protests. Uh, I mean, Navalny is not the first uh, serious opposition figure that has uh, emerged in the Putin period. Um, but um, the, 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 the obvious questions are, you know, how serious, if at all, is he a threat to, uh, to Putin? Or uh, is this just going to uh, uh, fizzle out, uh, alas, as, uh, as, as, as these things ha have happened so often before? Well, we, as, as you, you rightly point out, the, the, the very serious protests in 2011 uh, which were uh, directed toward the falsification of, of the parliamentary elections and then uh, 
Putin's return to office uh, after uh, Dmitry Medvedev stepped aside at Putin's behest, all of that did fizzle out. Uh, and so there are, uh, you know, there is, a, there is such a tendency. Will it happen this time? Uh, we don't really know. We don't really know. Uh, these are protests concerning corruption. Uh, corruption, of course, irritates people in Russia. But at the same time, it is proven historically to be something that the regime uh, can contain. Uh, it's not a, uh, a full-blown demand for freedom and for uh, the rule of law in Russia. Now, Russia itself has changed, even in the period since 2011. Uh, the, the country's uh, economy is stagnating and Russia has become more sophisticated. It has really for the first time, a serious middle class. It contains people who are worldly and have traveled, uh, who have access to means of information. Uh, and Navalny has proven himself a master of the use of the social media. For all those reasons, there is some basis for thinking that uh, people will use this protest as an opportunity once, once and for all to guarantee their future. But uh, it's, unpredict it's, it's, it's completely unpredictable. Uh, the, the, um, the issue here is, uh, that the regime tried to murder Navalny. But the focus so far of the protests has been on the regime's corruption. Uh, ultimately, if there's going to be positive change in Russia, it's going to have to focus not so much on the symptom, but on the cause. And the cause is the fact that uh, the, the country is 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 lawless human life has no value and uh the the polit the political system is is the prod product of successive acts of violence there were some very striking figures that came out the other day about the number of uh, millions of people who'd watched uh, navalny's video about uh, putin's uh, uh, Volga Palazzo uh, down on the Black Sea, um, uh, you know, which suggests that there's a lot of interest in uh, in, in 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 all the corruption and uh, Navalny. But um, what what would be so your, your your rough sense about? Uh, I mean, does 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 Putin, despite all the current noise, have a majority of Russians still more or less supporting uh, his 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 rule? Uh, or, or is there a danger of uh, um, that majority support, I assume you're going to say it's majority support, slipping away? Russia is a very difficult country to measure public opinion, which, by the way, can change overnight. Uh, the, 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 the palace in Gelenchek on the Black Sea, its existence has been known for a long time. Uh, and it is true that, that tens of millions of people watch the videos, but we don't have tens of millions of people on the street. Uh, as I believe that the number of people who protested in Moscow was 40,000. Uh, that's a big demonstration, but it's not threatening to the regime, just for re purposes of comparison. When uh, there were demonstrations against the sixth article of the Russian, of the Soviet constitution, that guaranteed a ruling role for the Communist Party. There were um, practically a million people on the street. Uh, when the uh, massacre took place in Lithuania in 1991, January 91 at the Lithuanian television tower, there were over a half a million people on the street. So, I mean, by the standards of what is possible, the, the demonstrations are not overwhelming. They do show a level of discontent. What people watch, you know, people will, uh, a big audience on the social media, uh, 90 million views, uh, it's impressive in a way, but it doesn't translate necessarily into a political movement that's capable of changing the situation in Russia. 
Uh, I think that um, support for uh, for Putin uh, is still considerable. It's largely passive. Uh, it's oftentimes based on fear of change, which in Russia's, you know, Russians have the experience of change and it's net, often been uh, not very beneficial for people. But at the same time, uh, there are a growing number of people in Russia who understand that this stagnation under Putin can't go on forever. Uh, can they be mobilized behind this vanguard that has appeared on the streets? Uh, can members of the ruling group uh, split from Putin and offer this a popular movement their support? Those are questions we don't have the answer for right now. Uh, we saw in Ukraine that it is possible uh, under the right circumstances to mobilize people. Whether the anti-corruption accusations in Russia are sufficient to do that, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. I mean, time will tell. There is certainly discontent, but whether it'll go beyond that, uh, uh, we can't be sure. The only thing we can be sure is that the regime will continue to degenerate uh, as all regimes that aspire to rule forever do. And that uh, the, if this challenge is not sufficient uh, to change things in Russia, a future challenge very well may be. Yeah. We think of uh, um, Putin's regime as uh, a pretty tough authoritarian uh, uh, police state. And yet, uh, as we've just discussed, um, social media is able to have uh, a pretty big impact. I mean, uh, uh, essentially it seems as if there's a considerable degree of freedom when it comes to uh, areas of media such as that. Is that, a, is that a potential weakness for Putin, the fact that in fact uh, his, his, his regime does allow sort of chinks of freedom, uh, including uh, 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 what is obviously a significant degree of media freedom? At least in social. Well, media. first of all, they can they can crack down on that on that freedom, and they may, and they may, but the but Putin the Putin and his confederates have ruled not through terror. Uh, by and large, there's you know there's selective terror. Uh, especially important to opponents are killed, like Boris Nemtsov, like Anna Politkovskaya, like uh, Alexander Litvinenko. But that's not the rule. Uh, the, 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 as a whole, uh, taken as a whole, the regime maintains it, its hold on power through corruption and through manipulation. Uh, the corruption is shared by a group by and and uh, by a rather large group, and the manipulation uh, uh, goes on all the time. In the official in the official media, the processing of the minds of the population, and this is pop, popular popular and possible because of the kind of psychological void that developed in Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union. Now I can explain this a little bit with reference to to an incident that I was involved in once when in the Soviet Union I was waiting in a, in line, people were lining up for potatoes. And someone in the queue started shouting, how long can we tolerate these lines? And a woman in the queue turned to him and said, never you mind, the whole world is afraid of us. Well, the Soviet people, Russian people, understood at some level that they lived worse than people in the West. But they consoled themselves that they were part of a great state and that they made the whole world afraid. And this was an important part of their self-esteem. It was fundamental to people. After the Soviet Union fell, it was clear to Russians that nobody was afraid of them anymore. And, uh, one of the, and, and that 
desire to restore a sense of lost greatness, of lost power, uh, that was a, a psychological resource that was available for any demagogue to exploit. When Putin came to power, uh, it was not that he was such an attractive figure. And by the way, we can get into the circumstances under which he came to power, which were in effect an act of terror against his own people. But when he came to power, this person who had no charisma, who had no political career, who had, you know, who he was not able uh, to, to uh, really speak effectively, uh, became a national hero because uh, people were able to see in him, and he played to this, someone who was going to restore Russia's greatness and its strength. Now, it can't be said that he's done that on a scale comparable to the Soviet Union, but to a certain extent, changes that have occurred under his watch have made Russia uh, more fear fearsome and more of a problem for the world than it was before. And that has been a great source of strength for him politically. And we saw the mechanism very clearly at the time of the Maidan revolt in Ukraine. The ruling group in Russia obviously feared that the Maidan example could become contagious and that Russians could duplicate in Moscow what the Ukrainians were doing in Kyiv. But uh, it was under those circumstances that they made the decision to seize Crimea and launch a war in eastern Ukraine. With predictable results, uh, Putin's popularity shot up uh, to unheard of levels, and uh, the Russian people completely turned their back on the, the real lessons for them and their, pos and their possibility of freedom that were presented by the peaceful, self-organizing Maidan revolt, which changed, which you know, removed a kleptocratic leader like Putin. Well, I think that that uh, that that might be a good point to hand back over to uh, to John. I think who is going to uh, um, follow up on uh, how we got to this uh, current state of affairs. Well, well exactly because um, David, we were both um, reporting on and watching the events of eighty nine and ninety one. And it did seem for a while that a new democratic Russia had emerged. Um, it was establishing something like the rule of law in a civilized society. People like Vladimir Bukovsky uh, went over to Russia and with some hope, it seemed, of uh, their making this vision a reality. And of course, um, the West and the Russian state um, had very friendly relations for a while under Yeltsin. Um, now, uh, how did we go from that the, the current situation. What went wrong? I think you have an earlier date for that decay starting, don't you? That, uh, I think that the question, what went wrong, uh, is, uh, is a question that needs to be asked in the West because it has, it has relevance not just for Russia, but, but, but in general for the future of democratic society. Uh, Sad to say that uh, the fundamental, many of, many of the fundamentals of communist thinking and communist ideology uh, were carried over into, into post-Soviet Russia, where their influence proved to be abs absolutely deadly. Uh, the um, communist ideology was based on what were called class values, uh, which uh, Lenin and the Bolsheviks posed in opposition to the universal values of the West, uh, which they dismissed altogether as having no, no social and political content. Class values were the values that could be used to build a new society. Uh, therefore, anything according to this interpretation that was uh, beneficial for the working class was right. Anything that got in the way of the working class and its revolution was wrong. Uh, there were no values that could be that could be applied to the actions of the working class because the working class was the source of values. Uh, 
under these circumstances, an entire population was inculcated with this. Uh, it was taught it in the schools, and the, it, the entire way of life was organized on this basis. Ultimately, of course, it resulted in a totalitarian dictatorship because the party spoke for the class, then the leadership of the party spoke for the party, and then the leader of of, of, of the Politburo or the leader of the organization spoke for the leadership. But what did it mean to restore un the authority of universal values after the fall of the of Soviet Union? It meant in the first instance, the rule of law, uh, because uh, the position of the individual uh, the equality of the ind of, of individuals before the law, in 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 effect, mirrors the the equality of 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 human beings uh, before a transcendent God. That authority was destroyed by the communists. I mean, the communist regime was the first regime to be based explicitly on in history to be based, ba based explicitly on atheism. And so the authority of higher values expressed in the rule of law was uh, absolutely fundamental for the spiritual, moral, political, economic recovery of Russia after four generations, five generations of communism. But what happened instead? Instead, the so-called young reformers under Yeltsin, uh, and Yeltsin is a former communist, was a former communist boss with a communist mentality. Uh, the young reformers assumed that the only thing that was necessary was the transformation of economic structures. Rule of law was completely secondary. And as a result, they began, began, began a radical, uh, transformation of the economy in Russia without the benefit of a commercial code, without the benefit of any kind of regulation, without any kind of ethical guidance, with a, a readiness to cooperate with criminals. Uh, the important thing for them was to take property out of the hands of the state and put it into private hands. And they thought that the market would resolve all contradictions. But in fact, the market resolved the market, and Adam Smith made this clear in his writing, actually, actually functions within, within the framework of a system of law. Uh, and uh, it cannot, uh, other, otherwise, it, it, it cannot be a true market. And uh, there was no true market in Russia. What you got was gangster capitalism. And uh, gangster capitalism and the flawed democracy eventually led to dictatorship, uh, which is what we have now. As soon as the, 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 the hold on power began to be challenged in the country by a parliament that did not uh, agree with everything that the reformers uh, uh, undertook, uh, they, they, they attacked the the the. the Parliament building with tanks. That is the event, I think, which you felt showed that we were not going to go in the right direction. It wasn't clear, but that's the way um, it looked. Um, at the time, though, the West supported that. And the West supported it because they thought that the, that the rule of Yeltsin, the democratic reformer, was now being challenged by some of the people who had tried to launch the coup. And, um, and they shelled the parliamentary building. Now. Um, what did we get? What did we get wrong in that analysis? What did the Western governments get wrong? And uh, what did it mean later that we had actually supported this essentially authoritarian action? Well, to answer the, 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 the last question first, you have to bear in mind that the shelling of the parliament was played out on Russian television. And those, the, the, those videos were repeated over and over again. Uh, and so, Russians were witnesses as uh, the leadership you know, attacked, attacked the parliament building, which was full of representatives they had elected. Um, that in itself was enough to break the whatever moral 
uh, whatever whatever moral principles there were in the society. And people said, well, if the president is going to break the law, then why shouldn't I? Uh, and uh, and after that, whatever whatever hesitation there was about turning capitalism or the transformation into into capitalism into simply, you know, a kind of gangster jamboree, uh, the, that, was, that, that was lost. So what is it that our people didn't know? Well, you know, I've dealt with, and, and I apologize in advance to anyone who's, 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 who's worked in uh, uh, the American government, but um, the, the bureaucratic structure of, of foreign policy is not in the U.S. in any case, and I believe in other places as well, is simply not an intellectual match for a country as, as complex as Russia. I mean, Russia is a country that you really have to study and you really have to know. And people want to apply the same superficiality toward Russia that they apply to every, every place else, and Russia doesn't allow them to. Uh, Russia is a country that creates false appearances. They, they began doing this under Catherine the Great when uh, 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 villages were moved around to show the progress in the countryside uh, to her minister, Potemkin. Uh, they did it under the Soviet Union and they did it uh, under Yeltsin. Uh, the, the facade of democracy was con concealed and obscured the criminal processes that were taking place. And the, West, and the West, and in particular the US, which bought into that uh, completely. What I've seen, you know, we, we, we have a very, at least uh, in the US government, uh, a, a habit of creating Russia experts by giving them bureaucratic dossiers and saying, well, you master this dossier, for example, should Russia enter the World Trade Organization? Should Russia conclude uh, this or that uh, agreement on limitation of arms? And some, you know, someone devotes time and, and comes up with something and he becomes an expert. And then we lose sight of the fact the person's not an expert at all. Uh, he's, he's dealt with one bureaucratic problem. Well, enough of those experts ex exposed to uh, the, the Russian talent for misrepresentation and deception uh, will, will, are, are capable of making catastrophic mistakes as they did in, in, in 1993. After that, 1993, there was no longer separation of power in Russia. All power was concentrated in the Kremlin and the degeneration that led ultimately to the 1999 apartment bombings uh, the rise of Putin, and everything that we have now was, was very much in place. David, you've been arguing that the, one of the problems of post-communist um, Russia is that the communists had vacuumed uh, out of the people all of the moral principles that had sustained the population in previous times, but hadn't succeeded in implanting in them successfully uh, a real belief in a new set of, of proletarian or Marxist values. In, in fact, at the end of the period of uh, communism, uh, there was a tremendous cynicism. Now, is there also another explanation? Um, this is a regime in which intelligence uh, officials have been unusually prominent. Uh, what do you think of the theory that post-totalitarian societies, unlike post-authoritarian ones, find it difficult to operate because in the period of totalitarianism, the elites in every other walk of life, apart from national security, have been more or less either got rid of unceremoniously or they've been forced um, to uh, run uh, their own uh, affairs, whether it's agriculture or ballet, uh, along Marxist lines, which really offer no true guide to specific areas of life. So that at the end of the day, you don't have experts and elites of a real kind in the, uh, the post-communist world. What you have is um, just simply an apparatus of power. 
Well, yes, this is this is this is this is true because I mean, under the Soviet system, for example, the uh, uh, it's I mean, they did have cultural life, they did have intellectual life, they had universities and even even uh, rather high level uh, academic research, but it all had to be carried out within the framework of the regime's ideology. So people became accustomed to compromising themselves. They became accustomed not to telling, you know, to what was often referred to in the Soviet Union as the maximum version of truth. In other words, uh, the most that you could say without getting into trouble. Well, that version of truth was, of course, an untruth. People who, 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 who grew up and who prospered in that situation were inevitably psychologically damaged. And it was from this group that the young reformers appeared. People like, I mean, Gaidar was an Orthodox communist. He was, he, were, he was the economics editor of Pravda before he became the leading capitalist in Russia. Uh, under these circumstances, uh, one of the big problems that Russia faced was that the people in charge of guiding the transition to a new society were themselves psychologically and morally damaged by their experience in the old society. And uh, it, it would uh, guide our switch from being uh, uh, an ardent communist to being, as he understood it, an ardent capitalist, but without really a, assimilating the spirit of capitalism and the the uh, and its its intimate dependency on the rule of law well before i hand back to mark to discuss the, this new russia in international relations um let me just um uh, ask this question uh, do you see at this point um with this larger middle class you've talked about uh, russia beginning to develop um, a new set of humane and civilized values, which will inevitably reflect elements in Russia's past, so that we don't any longer, we won't any longer, um, feel that this is a mysterious society, um, which really has little to do with the rest of us. It is, after all, it does, after all, emerge from European history the way um, the other European states do. Well, there, there are. Yeah, I mean, Russia. Ha first, first of all, Russia has suffered from emigration. Uh, a huge number, millions of people who could have been vital to the, to, the, to, the, to the kind of resurrection of Russia are now living elsewhere. Uh, and that is, uh, and they are not likely to return. That's been a, a very serious uh, problem is is and was a very serious problem nonetheless nonetheless there are many people in russia who are capable definitely of leading such a development but there the the there are, there are problems and off and they are connected with post soviet history i mean in the case of the soviet union there was the problem of of finally memorializing those who were the victims of that regime. In the last years of the Soviet Union, there was an immense movement led by the Memorial Society to commemorate and honor the memory of those who, uh, who, who, who had been murdered, who had been tortured and enslaved. And we, unfortunately, this movement was directed principally toward the removal of Gorbachev, removal of the regime. Once the regime was removed, once the, um, once the Soviet Union fell, the energy behind this, this, this effort uh, uh, disappeared. And in fact, many of the projects that were discussed were never completed. Uh, and this remains a task for the future to fully commemorate and, and and honor those innocent people who died as a result of what ha of, 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 a, of a really demented ideology. But unfortunately now, we have a whole new set of crimes which were committed uh, by post-Soviet Russia. 
And if the focus is how to make post-Soviet Russia a more normal state, which has greater respect for its citizens, the first priority has to be uh, the crimes of the post-Soviet era. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that the crimes of communism should be ignored, but, but history really is the issue in Russia, and, and, and both should be addressed. First, beginning with the post-Soviet crimes, because the, the, the gangsterism that took over in Russia was of a peculiar kind. It wasn't Latin American gangsterism. It wasn't American gangsterism. Or, or, or even European gangsterism. It was gangsterism carried out by people with a communist mentality. That means a, a, a level of cynicism that even a Western mafioso would not necessarily have. Uh, it, it's the, you know, it's the killing at random of, uh, of people simply to make a point. I mean, one, one example of this was that when there was an economic dispute, I mean, the, 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 it was often, often solved with, by Russian businessmen with the help of contract killings. Uh, and if, uh, as a warning, it was sometimes the case that a, a, a wealthy Russian businessman would order the killing of the head of security of his of his competitor, even though the, the person really was not involved in any decision-making, just, just to make a point. Uh, the element of provocation uh, is enormous as a device uh, for holding on to power, and that can mean killing your own people. So all of this I mean, the, 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 of course, the classic example is the bombing of the apartment buildings in 1999, which brought Putin to power. But to get back to history, uh, for a social movement in Russia, not only to change the situation in Russia, but also to create the conditions for something better, the first thing that has to be addressed is the history of what happened in Russia after uh, Yeltsin came to power. The 1993 uh, shelling of the parliament, the 1996 so-called election, bombing of the apartment buildings absolutely in 1999, Putin would not have come to power without that. The terrorist acts, Nordost, uh, Beslan, the assassinations, Boris Nemtsov, Anna Politkovskaya, uh, the, you know, the attempted poisoning in, of, of Navalny. Because corruption is one thing. You can protest corruption. But, but the real issue is, is in, in Russia is murder. Uh, and, and the truth about the murders. Uh, and on the basis of that, the country really needs another constituent assembly like the one that was uh, dispersed by the Bolsheviks. The, my fear about, about the present anti-corruption uh, protests is that uh, you know, th they, might, they might expand, they might develop, uh, they might attract the, the, the support of elements in the leadership. Uh, but would they establish a democratic and, and, and ethical system of government in Russia without a thorough, a thorough examination of the country's history and a dedication to creating a political system that, 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 that imposes limits on those in power? I mean, that's the question. Well, perhaps I can turn to Mark and ask him to raise some of the problems for the West and the rest of the world in dealing internationally with a regime and a country which is, in a sense, so psychologically uh, disfigured by what you've described. Mark. Well, in, indeed, uh, John and, um, and, and David, as you're talking there, well, before, before I get on to that just quickly, um, uh, in terms of um, 
uh, the uh, regime's attitude to, to history. You were talking about the earlier period when commemoration of the victims of the Soviet period was, uh, was, was allowed and we were very much struck, of course, when we had the, the uh, anniversary of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, how Putin uh, quite uh, conspicuously came out rejecting uh, some of the criticism that, that uh, Yeltsin and Gorbachev had made of that. And, uh, and, and basically we, we had a reversion to a Stalinist uh, defense of, of what happened there, which, uh, uh, which, which uh, spoke volumes, I think, about uh, uh, Putin's view of uh, cert certainly, certainly the Soviet heritage. But, uh, um, but, uh, but, but, but more generally, so uh, what, what I was going to, uh, on, on, uh, on Putin, Putin's um, uh, international perspective, he, he was famous for making that remark a while ago that, uh, that the great geostrategic disaster of the 20th century was the disintegration of the Soviet Union. How big a threat do you think he is uh, to the West? these days. Well, that statement, of course, reflects the, Ru the Russian mentality, the idea that uh, we should be powerful, we should be feared. And uh, as a result of the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, we were no longer, he, he didn't say that, but we were no longer powerful. No one was afraid of us anymore. So it was a geopolitical catastrophe. The idea that it was, uh, you know, a moment of, of of supreme liberation for, for, for Russian people is what's important. Uh, not the fact that the state that was dismantled could no longer uh, uh, intimidate others. But uh, so that shows, shows his values. But values are one thing and potentialities are, and, and capabilities are something else. Now, the, Russia has half the population, less than half of the Soviet Union. Its economy is less than half of the, the Soviet Union, even today. If the Soviet Union could not prevail uh, over the Western world, Russia for sure cannot. What Russia can do is it can create problems and, it, and, and it's pretty good at that. But it's, uh, you know, it, can be, it can definitely be limited. Russia's, the Russian leadership is principally a threat uh, to itself and its own people. Uh, with the proper measures taken by the Western countries, I don't think that we're going to, we're, we're going to face uh, the kind of threat we faced from the Soviet Union in which at any moment, tens of thousands of Soviet tanks could have, could have, could have burst through the, uh, uh, through the defenses of NATO and, and, and uh, driven toward the English Channel. Uh, the, uh, I don't even think they have a strategic advantage vis-a-vis -vis the Baltic states. I don't think they would even, even uh, uh, attempt uh, an invasion of the Baltic states, because, first of all, because they, there's no, no gain in it for them. And second of all, because these, you know, their immense corruption is, in a funny way, if we look at it in terms of world affairs, a kind of blessing. Uh, they, their, their, their priority is to stay in power and enjoy that corruption. And if, if, if an act of external aggression is going to destabilize their situation sufficiently to threaten their ability to enjoy it, they're not going to undertake it. Uh, the, the animating factor in the Soviet Union was the Soviet ideology. There's no ideology in post-Soviet Russia, All, despite the fact that they, they try to masquerade as, as defend, defenders of Russian culture or try, uh, Russian influence. What there is, the animating factor is the desire of a small group to make sure that it continues to monopolize property and power. And so that's, that needs to be kept in mind every time we think about the possibility of Russian aggression somewhere. Uh, they will, of course, take advantage of situations in which they don't expect any resistance. Uh, and they will surely try to take advantage of the psychological predisposition of the population to support anything that looks like an enhancement of, of the country's power. 
But, uh, you know, launching a war against real opposition, I don't think that they're, that they're likely to do that. I think that the, 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 uh, the danger is that they will create the kind of conditions inside Russia that will lead to instability in Russia, a country with, with an immense uh, arsenal of high-tech weapons, including nuclear bombs and missiles, uh, that it could, th that, that an uncontrolled situation could threaten the outside world, that's for sure. Or that massive repression could just shock the conscience of the outside world. I mean, those are dangers. Uh, but that's what, what, what I think we ought to be, uh, to be focused on uh, and not assume that, uh, uh, that we face an imminent mi military threat, although, we, although you know, which we can, de you, as, long as, we, uh, as long as proper deterrent measures are adopted, uh, we, we should be able to contain. That doesn't mean that the countries that are former Soviet Republics like Ukraine and Kazakhstan and Belarus will not face uh, aggression. That's a different matter, but uh, they will and they can. Uh, but uh, but in terms of the threat to the West directly, I, I don't see it. Yeah. Well, Joe, well, well uh, you've mentioned the Baltic states um, and, uh, and 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 uh, those other um, ex-Soviet republics. Um, I mean, in obviously there are a number of cases: Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia which are partially occupied by, uh, the, by Putin's regime um, uh, and so have become, uh, you know, uh, failed states, essentially. I mean, they, 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 they would find it very difficult to join the EU or, 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 or NATO, indeed. Do you, I mean, do, you, do you think Putin's happy with that sort of uh, result? Or, you know, if there were an opportunity to, you know, fully reintegrate those places into Moscow's sphere, would he, would he, would he grab that opportunity, do you think? They were the kind of statelets that exist. Um, uh, I think that, you know, uh, absorbing them, of course, uh, has international consequences and also economic consequences. And they, they serve the purpose of putting pressure on the respective countries without being absorbed. Uh, so I, um, I don't see the, and also we're talking about fairly small areas, um, Prednestrovia in Moldo Moldova, uh, South Ossetia in Georgia, Abkhazia. I think that, they're, that, that, that their real purpose is to put pressure on and to destabilize and keep weak the former Soviet republics, you know, that, that, that Russia wants to dominate. Yeah, I, I, what, what I meant more was uh, you know, if there was an opportunity for Putin to, ins to his, install his own you know, friendly regime in Kiev, you know, would he, would he, would he, uh, would he actively pursue that objective? Or what would, 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 would he consider that too hard? Well, they are actively pursuing that objective, just not doing it very well. I mean, the, 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 uh, the whole war effort in, in, in effect is uh, uh, an effort to control Ukraine uh, and an effort to neuter Ukraine. Uh, obviously, the, the, the effect has been to turn the population against Russia massively, but uh, it's, that's not necessarily how uh, Putin saw it when he embarked on this. And, uh, you know, it does make, you know, the, the, the war does make Russia a kind of player in Ukrainian politics because there will always be a part, a, a group, you know, a, a group in Ukraine that will be more sympathetic to Russia's demands rather than less, which gives them leverage that they should they shouldn't really have. Uh, but uh, you know, it, yes, I mean they would be happy to have someone uh, in Ukraine who they could control, 
uh, as and in fact in the other form, former Soviet republics as well. It's never worked out. But uh, having these these statelets as points of pressure is a kind of substitute for that. Uh, it 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 means that Russia cannot be ignored by these countries. They cannot pursue a truly independent uh, pro-Western foreign policy. The West will be cautious about establishing ties with them. Uh, there will be opportunities for internal subversion, all of these things. Putin has never liked um, the expansion of NATO um, uh, and uh, uh, you know, got, got, uh, the, the regime got very angry about the, you know, when, when all that happened in the, in the 2000s. Um, and, uh, uh, but it seems that uh, its diplomatic and other efforts uh, and, and pressure has never succeeded. Uh, and and, uh, and I, I imagine that uh, you know, when the next ones come along, which try to, you know, would try to join Serbia, Northern Macedonia, etc., again, Moscow will fail to prevent them from, uh, from, from joining NATO. Do you, do, you, do you think there's a degree of fatalism about, uh, about the enthusiasm of all of these countries to be, be part of the Western umbrella? Or do you see Putin remaining determined to do whatever he can to try and stop them uh, and, uh, you know, if, 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 if possible, even peeling some of the way in due course. Well, I'd like to, to I think and we need to point out that, that, that Putin was successful in preventing Georgia and Ukraine from becoming part of NATO. So and, and he is continuing to be successful because of the, you know, the, the, the Ukraine cannot become part of NATO under conditions in which it, 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 there's a war going on and it has contested territory because it's, a part of its uh, territory has been annexed by another power. So I wouldn't say so in terms of what they were, were really seeking to do and what were their most urgent priorities, they achieved them. As for, you know, Serbia, North, Northern Macedonia, other, other, other countries uh, further away from Russia, uh, they will make a lot of noise and they will undertake certain, may, may take, uh, take certain steps, but they, I think they understand the limitations of what they can do. They, they, um, we shouldn't, you know, they puff themselves up, uh, but, uh, and there are, there are certain ways in which they're dangerous, but uh, uh, Russia, as I, as I said, um, is a, it's principally a threat to the, it's a danger to the, to the, to the former Soviet republics, which are on its borders, and it's a th and it's a threat to itself. Uh, but as for a worldwide threat on the scale of the Soviet Union, it doesn't fit that description anymore. Which which lead, leads us neatly into um, what you see as the prospects for the for U.S. Russia relations under the Biden presidency. We have we have a kind of prototype of this with. The, the Obama administration. And it, it's interesting that one of, of Biden's first acts was to uh, announce that he's ready uh, to extend the START Treaty, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, for another five years without the verification measures that were being insisted upon by the Trump administration. So that indicates to me uh, I mean, we had a, with with Trump, we had a kind of paradoxical situation in that uh, Trump was actually fairly hard headed when it came to specific issues. Uh, you know, he, he it was he who authorized uh, the sale of arms, defensive arms to the Ukrainians. He responded to a chemical weapons attack in Syria. Uh, he imposed tough sanctions uh, in cooperation with others in the case of the Skripals compared to Obama, who did absolutely nothing after the murder of Alexander Litvinenko. Uh, but, what, what Trump, but Trump continued to engage in, the, in, this, in this really stupid and unacceptable rhetoric and, and uh, much to his own detriment. 
uh, on the, with the idea that he could somehow charm Putin. Uh, the, the period of charm, I think, is over. But it will be a good thing if under Biden, some of the same uh, realistic approach that uh, the Trump administration did, uh, uh, did, did have uh, will be preserved. I mean, time will tell. Uh, David, uh, you've given us a lot of your time. I'm grateful. I, I have two more questions for you, however. Uh, the first is, um, I think it's fair to describe as a pessimist, but as we've just been listening uh, to you, it's clear also that your pessimism has been realism a great deal of the time. So you, I'm not flattering you, it's just that you, the record is there. So my next question is, what about your new book? What are you telling us in that book that we should be paying attention to? Well, what it means, well, what do we mean by my, my new book is, is a collection of uh, the book that's out, which is called, called Never Speak to Strangers, is a collection of my writing over four decades, beginning when I arrived uh, in Moscow as a young, I was at that point, I was the youngest uh, correspondent, or one of them anyway, uh, up until the, the present day. It was sort of Russia from Brezhnev to, to Putin and Carter to Trump, Carter to Biden. Uh, and I tried to show in, you know, the, I mean, that book is, is, tries to show what it means to, you know, what, is, what remained the same in Russia. You had four different Russias. You had Brezhnev's Russia, Gorbachev's Russia, Yeltsin's Russia, Putin's Russia. And yet they were all the same in many respects. And that's what I was trying to show with the way in which the articles are, are, are organized. I'm also writing a book at the present time, but that's a little, you know, a, a history of post-Soviet Russia. But if we take both, both, both projects, what is it we're trying to show here, which is that it, a different way of thinking, uh, uh, a different way of looking at the individual and his value, I mean, the, the Napoleon had said that there are only two countries in Europe, Russia and everyone else. And uh, understanding Russia can help us understand ourselves, uh, understand the good things that we have here and how important it is that uh, not to treat the individual as raw material for the realization of, of some crazy political scheme, because that that's that is that's the story of Russia, that's the story of Russian history. Uh, the individual meant nothing, I and mean, he continues to mean nothing. And we, if there's mass repression in Russia as a result of these protests, we're going to see that. Uh, but but at the same time, the challenge, you know, Russia poses a challenge to the West. The West has always been intrigued by Russia. Uh, and uh, I mean, even Spaso House in Moscow, which is based on Monticello, was, was, was erected with the idea that we would implant Jeffersonian democracy in the soil of Russia, in the, in the Russian capital. Uh, or in, at that time, it wasn't the Russian capital, but it was the leading city. Moscow or one of them. And, uh, but in any case, uh, because Russia challenges the West with its interpretation of what an individual is, someone without rights who realizes himself through the activities and, and, and aspirations of the regime, not his own aspirations. Well, the West, of course, is based on completely different principles. And it would be a good thing for the world and definitely for Russia if our principles prevailed, and they can prevail, but it will require more of an intellectual effort than, than, generally speaking, we're willing to make. But David, I, I, I'm very, I'm, I agree with what you've just said, but you're sitting at the moment in Washington, and as, and I'm, as you look at what's going on in the United States, 
And I'm not talking here about either Donald Trump or the new Biden administration. I'm talking about what's happening in its universities, in your corporate, uh, among your corporate elites and corporate boardrooms, in the media. One has the impression that there, the other point of view, the non-Western point of view, the contempt for the individual that you mentioned, but also the desire to impose uh, on everybody a conformity and a single proper view of how we should view both um, communal life in politics and also personal life uh, is, is challenging and in a lot, of a lot of the times is actually defeating the set of values that, that you value as being peculiarly essentially Western that I feel the same way. Do you, uh, how do you um, look at that movement? How do you look at those developments? Um, and where, how do you think they are going to play out? Well, I mean, we, what we're seeing in the US, and uh, I've seen this in other countries as well, uh, in Canada, uh, even in Britain, uh, to my, you know, as a, as a, a graduate of Oxford, it distresses me always to see bad things in Britain as well. There is a real degeneration. I mean, the, what, what, what the Soviet Union fell and created a, a kind of vacuum, a, 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 an intellectual vacuum, because, you know, ever since the French Revolution, or even before, you know, the question of socialism, uh, you know, dominated the thinking of people. It forced people to, to at least reflect on the, on, on the source of, the, on the source of values, the nature of an economic system, the nature of social justice. With that, once that was removed, and we entered the, the, the period that was sometimes described as the end of history, uh, the important thing was not to go looking for another pseudo idea, an, another ideology, or in the case of the US, a pseudo ideology, um, but on the contrary, to strengthen those institutions that are traditional and that are based on universal values. Well, unfortunately, hyperactivity, the internet, uh, the, the, the desire of people uh, to, um, the, the tendency of people to turn inward and to make, you know, and, and literally to make, to make academic disciplines out of their personal neuroses, all of this has had the effect of, of, of creating some kind of, some kind of substitute for an ideology uh, that uh, supposedly based on tolerance, but in fact, based on a, a mishmash of misinformation uh, and which is now with the help of, of, uh, of an uncritic, uh, uncritical uh, uh, intellectual class and universities that have deteriorated, begun to resemble in the way it operates in some respects, the Soviet ideology. We have informers, we have uh, our own punishments and police, corporations are serving as judges. Uh, it, you, you don't need something as sophisticated as Marxism, Leninism, in order to function as an ideology. You could just take any kind of hodgepodge of ideas, uh, no matter how unconvincing, uh, and once it becomes a mass phenomenon, it can function as an ideology. And uh, we're seeing that in the, in, in the West, in the US. So it's going to take, now fortunately it's not universal, it's widespread, but there are many people who reject it and have the, have the common sense to reject it. And it's going to be important now. You would have thought that having resisted world communism and Nazism, we would finally usher in an era of common sense. But we haven't done that, and so now, uh, under you know, in the in the in the in the era of well-being, the past efforts have created. Uh, we now have to contend with the kind of mental contagion that is uh, really, uh, and maybe it won't lead. I hope to you know to to, to 
a dictatorship or mass arrests and things as such, as, such as mark the 20th century, but it'll ruin lives and it will lead to social degeneration. And, and so this is really up to those who do have the intellectual wherewithal to do something about it. And I, I think that there is, there, are, there is pushback. There are people who are capable, but it's a challenge we shouldn't have to have had, we should not have had to have, uh, but, but it exists and we can't, we can't avoid it. Uh, uh, let's let, I mean, I think we can only hope that it can be dealt with relatively uh, expeditiously. It's going to depend a, a lot on, on the healthy uh, forces in society and the, and, the, and the readiness of people to allow themselves to be educated which in the internet age is uh, not something we can take for granted. David, thank you very much indeed. You've given very generously of your time. You know, it astonishes me to realize that there are a couple of other questions we should have asked you because you seem to have gone around the world, but we're going to, um, we're going to insist on inviting you back uh, in the future. So on behalf of Mark and on behalf of the Danube Institute, I'd like to thank you very warmly for coming here today and giving so generously of what is undoubtedly your wisdom. Thank you. Oh, thank you, John. Thank you, Mark. Thank, thank you, David.